So one one of the uh, things as as Marsha was saying is the selling your soul to the devil. And when when you're writing a a story for a musical, you get to um, you get to make a lot of decisions. You have to make a lot of decisions. I mean, what's going to happen in the story? Like you, it could go anywhere. It could um, how do you how do you um, reach that the denouement or whatever you're going towards? And uh, so one of the characters of, of the devil, uh, one of the characteristics of the devil is that he's like a kind of an ad man, and he's, he's always trying to sell his, his deals. So he gives Edward um, a 15 minute sold back guarantee, <laughs> risk free, so that he can try out this new life that he's going to take over uh, without, without having to worry about, you know, maybe go back to his crummy existence he had before. If he really wants to try this out, he'll love it. And he, uh, and the, the other thing the devil um, uses a lot is the, the idea of passage of time and how much that drives almost all of us nuts. That we, we, we see the, the days just sit by sometimes, especially as you get older. You know, find they seem to go faster. And so he, but, the, but for the devil, he has a different perspective on a lot of things. And he, his ideas are the passage of time is a beautiful thing because that prompts a lot of people and convinces them to take his deals. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So I was going to play some, some excerpts because I've done some like, demo recordings of this work, uh, which is, as Marcia said, it's called Mr. Fist. And you, know, you come up with these names, and then later on, well, of course I knew where I got that from. It's from uh, Mephisto, right? <coughs> that. So, you know, it's kind of like the penny drops. You know, of course I did that. <laughs> you make these, you make, come up with these ideas, and then you know, several years later, you think, oh, what are you doing? And then you go, oh, yeah, right. Sorry, what's Mephisto? Mephisto. Mephisto is another name no. for the devil. For the devil. Oh, okay. Oh, so, okay. just pulling out one phrase, one it's syllable. It's a character. It's a character, yeah. It's also several movies and yeah, musical figures. Opera is based called Mephisto, too. Yeah, like very good. Anyway, um, so I'll play a, the first little clip. I've got about four clips to play. And this one is. Um, the devil character, and it's pretty much the way the, the show begins. He, he's on stage alone and he's delivering kind of a lecture, tell, telling everybody how beautiful the passage of time is and how, how he just loves to see people deteriorate because he knows <laughs> that he can, he can take advantage of that. So now technology, as you know, doesn't always work with us. Wow. 
like an old friend I can trust. spending for the rest of your life, but then he, he, he suddenly and he starts to realize that that he's going to have to pay something at some point, and he was kind of wasn't sure if this was for real and all this, you know, had a lot of, kind of talked himself into it, but he took this deal and he knows that, it, that uh, the end of his life is going to be pretty disastrous, because uh, it's like a whole lifetime of visa bills all in one day. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody I I believe in that he's walking around the Nelson River and uh, but but I believe that devilish forces are kind of there doing the same kind of work and you have to watch out for the chance uh, the, the the danger of being uh, get suck, getting sucked in to try and you know 
instant gratification, selling your, your spiritual side, or whatever, for those kind of things. So there is a, even though you, you write a story about the devil, there's there are other undercurrents of things that, that they relate to in, in, in the world we live in. Um, and the other character that I included in the story was a guardian angel, who I brilliantly named Michael. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Uh, and and Michael is doesn't do a lot in the show, but, but especially in the early my early draft, but he does does appear at uh, at some key points. And uh, so one of the one of the things that I was thinking about is if you're if you are a guardian angel and you've got a lot of power, how do you decide who gets the grace? You know, because we're, you know, we're a few people out of seven billion, and a lot of people have pretty unbelievably awful existences. You know? and, and it always seems to me that uh, there's a lot of luck. I don't think it's, I, I personally don't believe it's, it's all because we deserve to be this happy that we're, you know, we're living in Nelson, so <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, wow, we're, but, but I am uh, amazed at how, how fortunate we are at times, but then, but how almost at random it seems that, that some people are so lucky and have things that go so well, and, other, and others just seem to have terrible existences. <clears throat> so what I thought of was Michael character, when I was, uh, a song that last year when I was trying to flesh out the story and the music a bit, so I, I wrote a, a song called Scattered Grace, for this character saying because it almost seems like grace, the, the concept of grace, the idea of grace, being in, in a state of grace, just is scattered almost like seeds sometimes. I don't know what the, I can't understand the, the rhyme or reason of why some people have it, some don't. Um, and if you were a uh, guardian angel, it would be hard on you to try and, and deal with that. So this is a, a <coughs> song about that. And this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is sung by Roger Lee, who many of you probably know in Nelson, who uh, sang uh, one, one of the lead uh, roles in, in my opera, Jorinda, when I was pretty young. So, here it is. Scattered grace, scattered grace, scattered grace, scattered grace, Any cry out for justice or love, but then
several hours of discussion. <laughs> but you're not allowed to discuss it right now because I have to finish one more answer. <laughs> and we don't have it, but there's food waiting in the public. And you can't have to. Anyway, do it. it might be a few minutes for a couple of questions. But um, when you write a musical theater piece, it's it, in some ways it's a fairly fluid process. In other ways, it's not at all that way. It's pretty pretty difficult to figure out what the leap is going to happen next in the story, or who's going to do what. You know, there's a lot of a lot of um, challenges, and 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 thing every 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 element of the story really has to kind of feel like it's organic and it relates to. Um, it's the logical thing that should be happening. I mean, I one of my favorite composers is Maurice Ravel, and he said his way of understanding, appreciating whether a piece of music is good or not, is whether when you hear something, if it sounds like the thing that should have, it should be happening, and following what you just happened. In other words, continuity is everything, so that so that you you get to a point. I mean, that doesn't mean you can't have surprise. Surprise is great, but but you can't have something which sounds like it's totally wrong. It has to be a, an instinct you develop for over years and years of working that you, you start to realize how, how to, how to uh, give something form and continuity. Um, so in this, in this project I'm doing right now, I'm working with the dramaturge, um, which is a pretty typical thing for uh, plays and musical theater pieces. And you get feedback from from your dramaturge and who says this doesn't work or this does work or whatever, but often it's things that you need to fix. And and one of the characters, um, his name, uh, her name's Peg, uh, she was a character in my original story who didn't really go anywhere uh, other than she was this guy's girlfriend and, um, and she kind of was a bit of a drag actually. Uh, and and I, the criticism I got was, can't you? Do something about her, make her a more redeeming personality. You know, so, uh, make her. And so I, so I started working on this idea, and she's somebody now who, who is, uh, has transformed. She's taken charge of her of her life, and, her, and she has a, has her own career. She's uh, has her own band. She's a musician too. And so she changed, transformed quite a lot. And then I, I even got her into a relationship with Michael. <laughs> and then I thought. Well, then, you know how we always respond to uh, to news that's happening, and, and when that dreaded T word got elected, uh, <laughs> I, I thought, and he made some comment about same sex marriages, how that awful that was. And I thought, okay, Michael will become my tailor. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> why don't we have a, a female guardian angel? You know, I so, know. And and so so. Mike, Ella, and Peg now have a relationship. Something's happened. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it, when I did that, I thought, this is, I kind of like this. It's working. And it's kind of interesting. It's a little more topical. Yeah. So, so the song we just heard, um, unfortunately for Roger Lay, he won't be able to sing that one. Because <laughs> uh, it's now on uh, an alto. It's going to be doing that. So, but, but that's that's the way it happens. <laughs> it's the way things fall. Um, so the, the final piece that I'm going to play is, um, again, the words have changed a bit, but this is an older recording. And you're going to hear the um, uh, a male version of, uh, there's still a microphone when, when, when this was recorded. Um, but it was some of the ideas that I used when I was writing the lyrics for this particular song, I think came out of a, a a, a, something I read in this second or third year university uh, written by John Keats, and it's called The Veil of Soul Making. And uh, this was written in 1819. And he wrote it to his brother and sister in law. He says, The common cognomen of this world among the misguided and superstitious is the veil of tears from which we are to be redeemed by a certain arbitrary <coughs> interposition of God and taken to heaven. What a little circumscribed and straitened notion. Call the world, if you please, the veil of soul-making. Then you will find the use of the world. I say soul-making, 
soul as distinguished from an intelligence. There may be intelligences or sparks of divinity in millions, but they are not souls until they acquire identities, until each one is personally itself. I think it is a grander system of salvation than the Christian religion, or rather it is a system of spirit creation. I will call the world a school instituted for the purpose of teaching little children to read. I will call the human heart the horn book used in that school. And I will call the child able to read the soul made from that school and its horn book. Do you not see how necessary a world of pains and troubles is? to school and intelligence and make it a soul, a place where the heart must feel and suffer in a thousand diverse ways. As various as the lives of men are, so various become their souls. And thus does God make individual beings souls, identical souls with sparks of his own essence. So pretty powerful, um, powerful writing, bit of writing. And so you'll hear you'll hear some of those little thoughts and the lyrics of this particular piece coming up. And this is really the last song of the um, of the work. And it's uh, in this version it's a quartet. It's going to become a quintet because I've seen one of the characters has now got much more of a life of her own. <laughs> so she gets to sing at the end. This is called, uh, and again, the titles change a little bit, but this is called Where I Began. <coughs> Yeah. 
that you are expressing and that are so <coughs> expressed in your music um, are, are extremely heartening and provoking as well. Mm -hmm. I thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that um, I'm just going to switch a couple of things around and I'd like us to have uh, a, a, a minute of meditation at this point. Um, and so I will say, um, with the wonderful music that we've been affording, to take a moment to sit with the ideas that you've just received. <laughs> 